I am pleased to be joined at the World Oil and Gas Week by Ernest Rubando, uh, head of the new petroleum directorate created by the Uganda government in April this year. Hello, Ernest. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Now, to start with, can you tell us uh, more about the establishment of the uh, petroleum directorate? What does it do exactly? Well, the government of Uganda has been putting in place a new institutional framework for the oil and gas sector, the country's oil and gas sector. And uh, the purpose of this uh, institutional framework is really to separate the management of the policy aspects of the oil and gas sector, the regulatory aspects of the oil and gas sector, and the commercial aspects of the oil and gas sector. And so in this regard, uh, a, new, a new petroleum authority for Uganda has been put in place for regulating the oil and gas sector. A national oil and gas company has been put in place to do the commercial aspect. And the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development has been restructured to create a directorate of petroleum therein. Uh, and this is a directorate that is going to support the minister on the policy aspects of the oil and gas sector. Now, this uh, restructuring of the uh, Ministry of Energy, what does it show in terms of the uh, change of policy uh, of the Ugandan government? Well, it really recognizes the progress the oil and gas sector, development of the oil and gas sector has made in the country. Uh, for a long time, the aspects of oil and gas in the ministry were really to do with the supply of petroleum products. And then later, uh, we got involved in promoting pet exploration of petroleum. And this was successful because we were able to attract industry in the country, industry invested, and we we're lucky oil and gas was found in the country. Uh, when oil and gas was found in the country, the government, the country put in place a national oil and gas policy. And this policy emphasized value addition to the oil and gas resources that were discovered. And uh, value addition meant aspects like refining and, uh, uh, and these things therefore led to a need for a midstream aspect of the oil and gas sector. So you can see we had a downstream aspect which was distributing petroleum products. We had an upstream which was doing exploration and was going on to do production. And then we had a midstream that was developing if we were going to refine. Now these three aspects of upstream, midstream and downstream have been brought together under the directorate. So the, the policy is a reflection of the progress in the oil and gas sector. But more importantly, it brings all aspects of oil and gas in the ministry under one directorate, where you have the upstream, the midstream and the downstream in one directorate. The ministry also has other arms like a directorate of minerals and it has a directorate of renewable energy. So you will appreciate that it's a, a much better structured ministry now because you have a ministry on top and then you have three very clear directorates, one dealing with oil and gas matters, another dealing with minerals and another dealing with renewable energy. Okay, so let's talk about the oil and gas discoveries you have made in the country. Uh, Uganda is part of one of the fastest uh, growing oil producing regions in the world, Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, last year, the country revised upwards its oil reserves by 85% to uh, 6.5 billion barrels. Give us an overview of the prospects in the country. Well, maybe a correction. Uganda is not only one of the fastest oil and gas producing parts of the country, of the world. Uh, Uganda and East Africa indeed are one of the fastest growing economies in the world, even without oil. Uh, so the oil is actually an addition. Uh, in Uganda, we have uh, about 21 oil discoveries that have been made. And out of these, uh, the, the, the oil and gas resources in those uh, discoveries are now estimated at 6.5 billion barrels of oil. And the appraisal work that has been done on these discoveries indicates that about 1.4 billion of this is recoverable. So the upgrade of the resources last year were a result of the appraisal work that the companies were, did on these discoveries. So that's how the numbers went up. And uh, you uh, have been working with uh, large uh, players in the oil and gas sector. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, your work with uh, Tolo Oil, for instance, and Total? Uh, a bit of a background, the companies that were working in Uganda before, we actually started with small companies. We had uh, Heritage, we had Hardman, we had Energy Africa, and these were very small companies, maybe about a billion dollars worth. Uh, this progressed and we had Talo Oil coming in along the way, it bought Hardman and it bought Energy Africa. 
Uh, and so we kind of moved in the center part with the Talo, which is an independent. Uh, subsequently, Talo sold its shares to Sinoc and Total, which by all standards are very large companies. So in the country now, we have Talo Oil, uh, a major independent, if not one of the biggest independents. Uh, we have uh, Sinoc from China, and then we have Total. And uh, the role of this company is very well defined to undertake exploration and go on to development and production. We have a good working relationship with them. Uh, they have been regulated in the ministry, but now they are going on to be regulated by the new uh, regulator, the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, since it has come in place. So we have a good working relationship. As a country, we appreciate the investment they have made in the country, and we have collectively been, succe collectively been successful because, indeed, significant oil, oil and gas resources have been discovered in the country, which is good for the country and is also good for the companies which have made the investment. And it's been very successful, actually, because the finding costs of oil in Uganda are actually quite low. It's less than a, a dollar per barrel, which is, I think, one of the lowest in the world. So it's been very successful, and the working relationship, we hope, is going to get even better. Uh, the country recently uh, launched a bidding round for six exploration licenses in the Albertine Rift Basin. Uh, what's the interest you have received so far? Um, could you give us an update on the process and uh, when it would close and uh, what could uh, come out of it? Yes, the country is implementing its first competitive licensing round. In the past, we had an open door policy where companies would come in, apply, we would negotiate, and if successful, we would get into agreement. But with the reduction of risk and uh, improvement of uh, understanding of the Albert and Graben, and as required by law, licensing now is through a competitive process. So the government announced a bidding round in February this year, a new bidding round, and uh, invited companies to pre-qualify. Uh, we had uh, about 19 companies applying, and uh, out of those 19 companies, 16 were qualified. So the 16 companies that were qualified uh, were requested to submit proposals uh, which will be evaluated before we negotiate agreements with them. Uh, these companies, the 16 companies, are now looking at uh, visiting the data room in Entebbe, Uganda. Uh, we are going to have a bidders conference on the 24th of November, so we expect them to come to Uganda and ask any questions or clarifications they have. They will also have an opportunity to go and visit the fields, the areas that they are planning to bid for, and we expect them to submit their proposals by the 15th of January next year. And after they have submitted the proposals, government will review the submissions and in a period of about two months we should be able to know which ones have been successful and we will enter into negotiations for production sharing agreements with those that have been successful. Okay yeah. and uh, first oil production in the country still at 2017? Well the outlets for production in the country according to a memorandum of understanding that government has signed with the companies includes three aspects of commercialization. One is the commercializing the oil through using crude oil to generate power. The second one is uh, using the crude oil, taking the crude oil to a refinery to refine it so that we get petroleum products for the, for, the, for the country and the region. And the third one is exporting crude oil by pipeline. The using of crude oil to power is something that we expect can happen very quickly if the need arises. So if the country gets into a power shortage like we have done in the past, we have agreed with the companies that we can put in place a system, a mechanism, where that crude oil can be used to generate power and therefore enable the country to have some power. That can be done on short notice. We think in a period of 12 months that can be done very quickly as, soon as, as long as the need arises. Uh, the other aspect of uh, crude oil for refining uh, that, is, that requires more crude oil. The, the first one of crude to power would not require a lot of oil. We expect uh, with less than 5,000 barrels of oil per day, maybe 2,000, 3,000, could be used to generate 100 megawatts of electricity or so. The second one, which is refining, uh, that needs some time to put in place. Uh, what the government has done, it has, uh, the policy is that a refinery is developed through a public-private partnership. And uh, so uh, two years ago, the government started the process of looking for a private partner uh, who we call a lead investor, because this private partner is supposed to have 60% in the refinery and 40% for the, for the public. 
Uh, this was done in an open system. We put out bids, companies applied, and uh, they applied in consortiums. Now the consortium led by RRT Global, a Russian company, was identified as the best among the competition. And we've been negotiating with this consortium of companies, which includes a VTB bank in Russia. It includes GS from South Korea. And uh, these negotiations are now due to be concluded so that we get into agreement with them. Then they can start the process of building a refinery in Uganda. This will take longer. We think the whole process can take three, can take, uh, three to four years. And that's when the refinery can come in place. And so this uh, production to the refinery would therefore come around 2019, if it is going to the refinery. Uh, the third commercialization option is the export pipeline. And uh, the export pipeline, of course, uh, Uganda is uh, land-linked, so we are not on the coast. So the pipeline would have to go through one of the neighboring countries to go to the East African coast. And the options we now have, there are three routes that are under evaluation, two routes going through Kenya and one route through going through Tanzania. And uh, government, the government of Uganda is interested in getting the least cost route to the coast. And this evaluation is being undertaken. And when this is done, then the process of structuring the com commercial aspects of the pipeline, identifying the partners in the pipeline, will then start. So we expect that that should take another maybe four or five years before it comes into place. So those are the commercialization options that are on the table. Each of these commercialization options has a different time frame. Uh, but overall, as a country, we are very excited because all of these are opportunities for the country. Uh, starting production of crude oil is very important, both to the investors and to the country. But as a country, it's also important that we also look at the stages that are before the production of oil. Because as you would appreciate, there's a lot of investment in developing the oil fields. We expect this to be about $10 billion. There will be a lot of investment in building the refinery. This is expected to be about $4.5 billion. There will be a lot of investment in building the pipeline, which is also estimated at about $4 to $5 billion. So all these things that happen before uh, the production of oil are very important for the country, and we have to make the necessary arrangements for them. Finally, I'd like you to tell us how you are working to make Uganda a favorable and positive business and operating environment for oil and gas players? Uh, okay, uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of efforts are being made in Uganda to make it the destination for investment, not only in the oil and gas sector. So we in the oil and gas sector are doing our part, but I must admit that we're also benefiting from the other broader efforts that are being made in the country to make it a more attractive investment destination. Some of these things are there's a lot of effort to ensure that there's security in the country, and indeed Uganda is a very secure country. Uh, the, part, the institutions in Uganda that are managing the macroeconomic framework are doing a very good job to ensure that there's a very stable macroeconomic environment. So that's something that the oil and gas sector benefits from. Uh, coming to the oil and gas sector, uh, the institutions, as I've explained earlier, have been put in place. There's a regulator, there's a commercial aspect, there's a policy arm. Uh, that makes it more predictable for the companies. New and modern legislation has been put in place. Uh, one, two years ago, a new petroleum law was put in place, and a new midstream law was also put in place. Uh, a Public Finance Management Act, which includes how petroleum revenues will be managed, has also been in, put in place. Uh, the regulations that will operationalize these laws have also been put in place. So we have a very stable institution and regulatory framework for the sector, which makes it very predictable for the companies. Uh, this should be very attractive. And uh, often we get engagements with the companies to look at the fiscal aspects of the, the, the sector with a view of making it attract them, attractive for them to make the investments that are required. So those are really the efforts that uh, are being put in place. The government has also made a very big effort to ensure that it trains its people. So when the investors come into Uganda uh, in the oil and gas sector, they, they, they are able to dialogue with people who can speak the same language. And that makes it much easier for them. So those are the efforts that we're really making as a country to make it an attractive investment destination in general, but also very specifically to make it a very attractive investment for the uh, oil and gas sector. And as Rabondo, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>